We know today as Palm Sunday, the Sunday before the crucifixion, the Sunday when Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Jesus, he rides into his capital city as a conquering king according to the Old Testament prophecy uh, of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. The multitudes come out to welcome him, uh, laying before him their cloaks and branches of palm trees. The people, they hail him and praise him openly, shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But Unfortunately, though, the praises that the people lavished on Jesus was not because they recognized him as their savior from sin, but they heaped praises on him out of their own desire for a deliverer, just like Moses, one who would lead them out of Roman bondage and oppression and uh, um, become their political king. Now these same people who hailed him as king with their many hosannas quickly turned on him when he failed in their expectations. He failed them in their expe expectations that he would lead them in a massive revolt against their Roman occupiers. And uh, within a few days, just a few days, literally, their hosannas would change into cries of crucify him, and they would soon reject and abandon him completely. So it is against this backdrop that I want to place my text, which is taken from the first Corinthians chapter 1 verses 17 and 18 and it is from that same backdrop that I want to pull my topic which I call the old rugged cross. You remember this hymn on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. So let us take a moment and go to our text in First Corinthians chapter 1. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, I think... I can say to you this morning without fear of successful contradiction that we are living in an age, we are living in a day when the message of the church is changing, changing radically, changing fundamentally. Churches and even whole denominations they are moving from the old message, from the old story of salvation through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we are moving towards a message of salvation through social activism, which is really salvation through good works. The old bloody message of the cross is quickly being replaced by a bloodless preaching that lacks power and lacks hope. It's a gospel 
of a crossless Christ and a Christless cross. Now, a crossless Christ is liberalism. A Christless cross is conservatism. A Christless cross and a crossless Christ, that's Jesus, my friend, on your terms. But the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross is about sin. It's about sacrifice. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Because sin is a bloody issue. And whenever sin happens, blood has to be shed because the life is in the blood. So Christ came to die not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous, because it's the sick who needs the uh, physician. See, Christ came to die for sinners like you and like me. He came to save the whole world of lost humanity, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have uh, everlasting life. Now, we are here this morning because 2,000 years ago, on a blood-soaked cross, on a skull-shaped hill called Calvary, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He died for your sin and for my sin as well. So I thank God for the cross of Calvary. I thank God for Jesus' suffering, for his substitutionary, vicarious, sacrificial, sinless death on the cross. Brothers and sisters, the preaching of the cross is a strange message. It is strange because our text tells us for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. See, it is foolishness to the world. And the word foolishness comes from the Greek word for moron. So the world thinks that we are morons, that we are crazy, that we are senseless for getting up on a Sunday morning like this morning when we could be you know, in our bed resting and sleeping. We are here to hear God's word, to hear God speak to us. And they think that we are morons, that the preaching of the cross is foolishness. The world thinks that we are fools for trusting in God, a God that we have never seen, for believing in a cross we have only heard about shouting about a crucifixion and a resurrection we only heard preachers preach about and, uh, uh, and, and, and a resurrection and a crucifixion that we have only read in a book written by men they say called the bible but you know what we are here this morning not because we are fools not because we are crazy not because we have lost our senses. We are here because the only thing that really makes a sense to us is Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And uh, not only because the Bible tells me so, but because Jesus, he lives in me by his spirit. Uh, and uh, I know in the inside, I know there's a witness, there's a knowing in the inside that Jesus, he really, really loves me. I know deep in the inside also that I could have never made it in this life if I did not know that God really cares for me. Hallelujah. See, God, he has been good to us. God has been good to you. God has been good to me. So, you're not a fool, bro. You are not crazy, sis. You are not 
out of your mind because the only thing that makes sense is if it had not been for the Lord, my enemies, they would have already swallowed me up. See, the world thinks that we have really lost it. Lost it to get up every week, see, to come to church to hear the same story, to hear the same story about Jesus. And you know what? Even this morning, it's the same story I'm, pre I'm preaching. I'm not preaching a different message. Every Sunday, I preach the same message over and over and over again about God's love in Christ Jesus, God's Son, who gave his life a ransom for many. That if you receive God's free gift of salvation, you'll have peace that passes all understanding. A peace that the world cannot give you. And your joy will be full. You'll enjoy eternal life with Jesus forever. And because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, he has gone to prepare a place for us. And he will come back again to receive us unto himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I have been preaching that message. I have been preaching that same message for decades. And you know what? You come every Sunday expecting to hear the same old story about Jesus and his love. Hallelujah. So either something is wrong with you or something is wrong with the story. And uh, since nothing's wrong with you and nothing's wrong with the story, I'm talking about the message of the cross. It's got to be foolishness to them who are perishing. It's got to be. And uh, you know what? How can you ever let somebody who is perishing tell you anything to start with? You see, it's like I'm standing on, on the bank, saved, and you are in the river drowning, but you want to give me advice. Makes no sense at all. Absolutely no sense at all. So to the lost, to the perishing, to those on their way to hell, that is what uh, those who are perishing means. The idea of trusting a suffering Bleeding man for salvation is moronic. To them, it is moronic. And when you go a little lower down in our text, listen to what it says. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. I note here, the foolishness of preaching, not foolish preaching. It pleased God. God, by the foolishness of preaching, to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, you know, to preach the gospel of the cross as if it comes from some philosophic system is really to rob it, to empty it of its power to save. It's to nullify its effectiveness, its efficacy. See, because uh, uh, this is what Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe, uh, to the Jews first, uh, and then to the Greek. So the gospel is power, my friend. Uh, 
the gospel is power. So it, it is never any, anything about theology and doctrine and apologetics and seminaries and degrees and so on as important as those things are. I'm not knocking them. They, they have their place. But the gospel is power. It's the power of God. Hallelujah. The gospel of the cross is about a man dying. And it is just not about any man dying. Because, note this, there were other men dying on crosses other than Jesus. Like the two th thieves who were with him. But when they died, nothing happened. But the Bible says when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom, knocking out forever an intermediary between God and man. Heaven's doors were thrown wide open, and now every man can go to God for himself, but through the cross, through the blood of the Lamb. You know, that's why I really can't get with um, folks like Tupac and Jay-Z and uh, those Hollywood rappers and singers because I believe in a cross. Let, let, let me tell you what I mean. Their music could be playing and it doesn't touch me. I'm not moved by it. It doesn't do anything at all for me. But you know what? Something happens when I hear somebody singing. There is a fountain filled with blood, uh, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge uh, beneath that flood, uh, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood, shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God are safe to sin no more. You see, something happens to me when I sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day see here's the marvelous and praiseworthy thing about Jesus and Christianity my friend all of the other so-called religions of the world they tell you well get yourself together and then come and meet us on our terms see what they're saying is that you have to do something in order to go over there to be with them you know like once you are enlightened once you have received the light once you have pulled yourself together you can now be part of them. But the marvelous thing about Jesus and Christianity is this. Uh, Jesus, he does not wait for you to get yourself together. He comes uh, even when, while you're still in your sins. When you are in the ditch, he gets in the ditch with you and helps you to stand up on your own feet uh, and he walks with you throughout uh, your whole uh, Christian journey. See? So that is what separates Jesus and Christianity from all other religions and their so-called prophets. Now, the cross is you know, the symbol of the plus sign of mathematics, but in Christianity, the cross is God's plus sign for my minus-minded humanity.
Um, let me open that for you. Everything in my life that was in the deficit column, the cross puts in the plus column. Everything about me that was a minus, the cross made it an asset instead. So the only one who can really shout here are folks who uh, had stuff in the minus column stuff that they are ashamed to talk about and I'm also talking about stuff that you did last week that God should have minus you out for but you repented yes you humbled yourself you confessed your sins and at the cross it became a plus for you God forgive your minus minded humanity. It all happened at the cross. So the Bible says to them that are perishing, what I just shared with you, that's a strange message. It's foolishness to them. They think that we are crazy to come together like this, this Sunday morning, to talk about a man who died one Friday, 2000 years ago. And I submit, see, I uh, accept that certainly that would be really crazy, really, really crazy if that was really the end of the story, that this man died one Friday evening. But hang in there a minute. I want to say this to somebody. You may be here this morning and you may be in the Friday of your situation, but stay around because I want you to know that Friday is not the end. Because in three days, there is a Sunday morning coming, my friend. Hallelujah. So the Bible says that early Sunday morning, Jesus, he got up from the grave. And because he is alive, he will resurrect your broken dreams. He will resurrect your torn up life. He will resurrect your dashed hopes and your crucified dreams if you put your trust in him and in the finished work of the cross at Calvary. So it is foolishness to the Greeks. It's a stumbling block to the Jews, the Bible says. But to us who are saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. Now, not only is the preaching of the cross a strange message, it is also a shocking message as well. Uh, check this out. Crucifixion was considered to be the ultimate in cruel and uh, degrading punishment. And uh, it can be traced back to the ancient Persians, which are today modern Iraq. And those Persians, talking about crucifixion, they would publicly humiliate vanquished foes by exhibiting their corpses on spikes. Yes, they did that. That's why in recent times, that terrorist group, ISIL, they would cut off the heads and impale those heads on spikes <coughs> when, when they were in their heyday. And that came from the Persians and their version of crucifixion, which was, as I said, to publicly humiliate, degrade, and shame the victim. Now, later on, the Carthaginians and the Romans, or the Carthaginians and the Romans, they changed it by devising a more cruel, inhumane, and torturous, torturous death. Not by impaling on a spike, but by hanging on a cross. Now, for a particularly slow, excruciating death, the Carthaginians would tie the person on the cross 
and tie that person with rope and let that person expire as that person's weight slowly cut off his blood circulation. The arms would slowly become gangrenous and they eventually died of asphyxiation. Now, for quicker death, the Romans, they nailed their victims to a cross so they would bleed to death. Sometimes they would aid the process by squidging uh, them um, um, beforehand and uh, breaking their legs on the cross. Now that's what they did to Jesus. They whipped him all night long, the Bible says. They hit him with their fists. They blindfolded him and mocked him and hit him in the face and said, if you be the Son of God, tell us who struck you. They put nails and spikes and pieces of bones on the end of, of a whip and they whipped him until his back uh, was lacerated from the stripes. They mocked him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They cursed him and they spat in his face, uh, which was the ultimate, ultimate insult. Now, Roman crucifixion was so degrading that a Roman citizen could only be crucified by the direct edict of Caesar himself. So, to the Jews, crucifixion meant that the person was outside of the covenant. That's why crucifixion always took place outside the gates of Jerusalem. And that's where Jesus was crucified, outside the gates of Jerusalem. But you know what? As humiliating and degrading as crucifixion was, the teaching of the early church was always focused on crucifixion and resurrection. They never strayed from that message. Here, what, uh, how Paul puts, puts it, if Christ is not raised, our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain, and we are yet in our sin. And if in this life only we have hope, we are among all men most miserable. He died according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul said, we preach that message. You believed it. Hallelujah. So that gospel may appear foolish to some, but inbuilt in the gospel is the power of God to save sinners, my friend. And I need to say this right now, you know, because one of the most reprehensible, disgusting things to happen to preaching in the last 40 to 50 years is what you have been seeing on television. And I want to say this, you know, God has not called us to be celeb celebrities. God has not called us to be showboats. You know what? You are not a cel celebrity. I am not a celebrity. We are servants of the Most High God. Because when it's all over, my friend, he is not going to call me bishop. He is not going to call me doctor. He is not going to call me reverend doctor. He is not even going to call me pastor. Servant. That's how he is going to address me. See, but today, preaching has become crowd-pleasing and not cross-centered because we want to make people like us. But I'll tell you something, my preaching is never going to be appealing to the world. Yeah, the world is never going to be comfortable with the preaching of Farouk Muhammad at Faith Community Church because I'll tell you what, all I have is Christ and Christ crucified and that's all that I'm going to preach about. See, I'm going to preach 
uh, and the fact that he died one Friday, he rose from the dead Sunday morning, because that's enough to save anybody, my friend, because that's the gospel. That's the gospel. So the message of the cross is strange and shocking, yet it is a simple, simple message. And it's in its simplest form, this is it. We were on our way to hell, lost and without a savior. Now, if we had needed money, God would have sent us a banker. If we had needed knowledge, God would have sent us a philosopher. But since we needed saving, God saw us. And we needed saving, God sent us a savior. Jesus Christ, my friend, in its simplicity, this gospel is that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save lost sinners. But you know, lostness and lost sinners, they are just not about drug addicts and prostitutes and murderers and criminals because some of us we don't have that testimony but you know what is your real testimony that god he kept you from off the streets god he kept you from being a prostitute god kept you from going to jail he kept you from being a drug addict and uh, he kept you not because you're so good or you're so holy because simply put god he just had his hands upon you and uh, again it wasn't because of you it is because somebody prayed for you so the message of the cross is strange it is shocking and uh, it is simple so then what's the purpose of the message of the cross what's the purpose of the cross why did an all-knowing all able god choose such a degrading and demeaning way to die for our sins he could have died in so many uh, uh, a million different ways now the first reason i believe is that in christ's death on the cross God made a bold, bold statement for all to see. A bold statement of his boundless, matchless love for the lost sinners of this world. That no matter what you have done or where you have been, God loves you. No matter how low down you've been, that there is still room at the cross for you. Though your sins be as scarlet, he says, they shall be made as white as snow, because grace is always greater than sin, my friend. Now, the second reason for the cross is to provide salvation, because there is no other way to cleanse sin but through the precious blood of God's Lamb, Jesus Christ. No other way. Now, Oprah Winfrey once said that there are a thousand ways to get to God. No, Miss O, there's only one way. One way to get to God. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way. I am the way, the only way, the truth and the the life no man cometh unto the father but by me if anybody were to come through any other route uh, route jesus said uh, uh he's a, a a robber and a thief jesus is the only way that's the bedrock you know of our christian faith that the only way to get to god is through jesus christ the third reason is that the cross is about defeating satan you see satan thought that he had a jesus when jesus died on that friday 
but at the end of the day, Jesus defeated death, see, hell and the grave, because he re resurrected the third day. And he re resurrected because an innocent man had died. So God had to raise him from the dead. Satan had no knowledge about that. Couldn't know that. Because the Bible says, if he had known, they would not have crucified the king of glory. Now I want you to see this. When Jesus went to the cross, he stood in the midst of two thieves. I'm talking about strength in the midst of weakness. Right in the midst of wrong. Innocence in the midst of guilt. And uh, all of the time that he hung on the cross, all of the time, from the sixth hour to the ninth, the Bible says that he kept on preaching. Hallelujah. That means that you've got to be on a cross and still maintain your focus and still speak words of life. While you are dying, you still got to speak life. While you are going through changes, you still got to speak life. While you're going through adverse uh, situations, you still got to speak words of life. Now in closing, this is what Jesus told his disciples. If you want to follow me, you must first deny yourself, take up my cross and follow after me. Now, look at this. He did not say, take up a cross. He did not say, take up any cross. He didn't say, take, take up the cross. He said, take up my cross. Meaning that every person has their own unique, peculiar, special cross. Now, the cross is the thing that God allows to stand up in your life to kill your will, your flesh, and uh, your pride. So your spouse may be the cross. See, that cross is a, uh, a spouse who doesn't understand you, or it may be a husband who doesn't even appreciate you. That's be, that may be your cross. That husband, he's always comparing you with other people and you stay in bed and you cry yourself to sleep. What has happened is that God is killing your will with that cross. Your cross may be a child that you poured everything into and they grew up and broke your heart. You had so much hope and pride that they were going to be everything you wanted them to be and then things turned around and uh, you ended up saying god you know i don't understand how i can help everybody else and at the same time be losing the war in my own house so you prayed fervently and you prayed all uh, fervently you rebuked you anointed you prayed Yet the trouble is still persisting in your life. Let me give you a rule of thumb here. Anytime you pray for something fervently and God does not move it away, it means that God is using it, is using that thing to get some glory out of your life. See? So the truth of the matter is that the cross is the thing that exists in your life, that crucifies the flesh, that teaches you how to love unlovely people, and teaches you how to be faithful even in the midst of pain. And the cross is also that thing in your life that the devil keeps telling you to come down from. Hear what the scripture says, 
uh, with Jesus on the cross. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross, they said. See, no, it's like if your cross is your marriage. I'm talking about marriage that's supposed to teach us how to be kind and patient and loving and sacrificial and so on. But the devil tells you, you know, you are not comfortable in this marriage. And you don't have to take that. So why don't you leave? You don't have to put up with all of that. You are better than that. What the devil is saying there is you come down from your cross. But uh, let me tell you this. If he can talk you out of your cross, he would have uh, talked you out of your crown. And God is saying to somebody here this morning, your crown is your cross. And if you can just stay on your cross, Though tears be run down your cheeks and pain is everywhere. Though you keep getting all those other options like, you know, uh, that, that unsafe person that you, um, that you could marry. Uh, it appears to be so logical and uh, attractive for you to do that. And the temptation is great yet God is saying to you if you can stay on that cross until there's no pride left in you until you have humbled yourself in submission to his will if you can stay right there on the cross and remain faithful to what God has called you to do and although you wonder in your mind, will I ever be happy? Will I ever have peace? Will I ever be appreciated? But God is saying to you, if you will stay on the cross, I have this promise for you and for you especially. Because if you suffer with me, God says, then when all is over you will rule and reign with me with an iron rod forever and ever and ever for all eternity so let us bow our hearts my friend in prayer father in heaven lord we thank you for commending your love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming. We thank you for taking our place on Calvary's cross, for drinking the cup of wrath that was to be poured out upon the nations. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your precious blood for the sins of the world, for accepting my judgment and taking my place so that I can have life and life eternally, that whosoever believeth in you shall not perish but have everlasting life. I pray, God, that somebody who is listening here this morning that they will embrace your love and free gift of salvation. Father God, give them a revelation of Calvary's cross and the immensity and the depth of your love for all of mankind. That if we would only accept your free gift, we will abide with you and not perish. So God, I ask your blessings upon each person under the sound of my voice. In the name of Jesus, I release the goodness, the favor, and the excellence upon them in Jesus' name. And if you are here right now, and you have never made a concerted effort to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is no rocket science in it. It's a simple message. 
Just say, Lord Jesus, I heard that you loved me, you died for my sins. Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And that's all. He says, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. So, if you would stand for the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace, now and forevermore. Amen and amen and amen. God richly bless you. See you next week.